Life is alive! <laughs> In today's episode, we review the classic 1931 horror movie Frankenstein! <laughs> Frankenstein, the original, starring Boris Karloff, a horror sci-fi super classic. Dr. Henry Frankenstein, played by Colin Clive, he's obsessed with assembling a living human being out of parts from exhumed graveyard corpses. And his assistant, by mistake, steals a criminal brain from the medical hospital, and what ensues is a monster out of control terrorizing the village. If you've never seen it, you've really got to, to, to see this. And if you haven't seen it in a while, Watch it again with some more appreciation yeah. from what we we're talking about. Turn. 10. Mm. I'm sorry, Joe. I have to give it a solid 10. And I'm going to find out where you gave it a chip yeah, point. Yeah, I, I chip off the old bolt off the Yeah, neck. well, you know. Okay, but I give it a 10. And I'm going to clarify every reason why this deserves a 10. Yeah, I'm going to question you on that too. Marker. I'm going to question you on that too. The scene opens up, you're in a graveyard. Kind of like, again, you got to picture yourself in the 1930s. You're not sure what to expect. And you see Dr. Frankenstein and Fritz waiting for a fresh corpse. And they were very smart. They didn't do many off studio location shots. Right. Most of it, if, I don't know, maybe all of it? I'm so, not sure. Yeah, pretty much all of it, but it, it's very magical looking. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about the old sets. And they have the grave diggers there. And you give this movie, I'm telling you, two minutes. You are sunk into it. I don't care if you can't stand black and white. Moving away from the graveyard scene, the scene I, I love best before the birth of Frankenstein is when they're in the large, I guess, medical auditorium, uh, Dr. Waldman. He's explaining anatomy, his anatomy to, to his students. And I love when Fritz comes in later on after everyone leaves. It's dark. He's looking through the window and he breaks in and he's able to get the brain. There's two canisters of brains, one that says normal and one that says abnormal. And he picks up the normal one and he's hunched back. So he's got like a little kind of wobble to him and he's not the smartest person and all of a sudden <laughs> shatters and the brain is splattered all over the floor and it's like oops again i didn't know if that was meant for comedy it was or if that was that was because no, i was like for comedy i'm laughing and i'm, I'm like about that meant that for that? To the comedy in this thing. and it's like okay then, brain no good let me get the, the other brain, brain not no realizing good. it's the abnormal yeah. brain of a criminal yeah. And of course, he's not going to tell his boss he messed up, no. Dr. Frankenstein. So he brings the brain over to Dr. Frankenstein for Dr. Frankenstein to complete his mission, to take all the different body parts or body pieces into the lab, connect them all, and to insert the brain. Because the brain is essential to resurrection. Right. Classic scene where Dr. Frankenstein, as I did in the intro, it's alive! I mean, that's not only something that cinephiles would know, but it's sometimes used in other Oh, constantly. Pop culture. Yeah, it's completely, yeah. It's a very tender scene where the monster meets this little girl by the water. It looks like a lake. A little seven year old. And she's playing with flowers and she's throwing flowers in the water. And as a seven year old, you're not thinking anything is wrong. You see this large person, which is the monster. They have a connection. And it's the first time you actually see Frankenstein's image change from this horrible, angry monster. Well, he's uh, scared most well, of the time. he's scared. Many people compare the monster to like a abused puppy. They created him. He didn't want to be there. Right. And they abuse him. They tie him up. Especially so Fritz goes crazy Fritz, with Fritz him. Fritz goes and whips him. Um, Fire scares yeah, him. Yeah, and, and just tries to like, not only bully, but like seriously harm him. But when he meets the girl, his attitude changes. And Boris Karloff does this really like first time the monster smiles. And Boris Karloff does it so well. And he slows his motions down. Right. So that the viewer is sort of in, like captured into the scene of this tenderness scene. As the girl is throwing the flowers in the water, yeah, the monster's like happy now. And he doesn't realize it. He doesn't know. But he's seeing the girl throw things the in the water. The little petals one little by petals, one. And all of a sudden he picks up the girl because he's thinking it's... She's it's, a petal. Yeah. It's, it's, She'll float. Right. He throws her in the water and she's screaming. She, but the monster doesn't realize what's going on. But he gets scared yeah. and he runs away. Right. And it wasn't until like he realizes, oh no, something's wrong. She's yes. not floating. She's not... And he... He runs away. Right. And that's when the townspeople, the father of this murdered daughter, comes into town to testify that my daughter's been murdered by the monster. 
we need to go after him. And the thing about it, um, the little girl, the, w the way they got this idea is when he came out in his costume, he came and the little girl walked in and she had never seen him in full costume. And she went up to him and goes, oh, hi, how are you? And she wasn't afraid at all with this crazy looking thing. And actually the director thought, I'm going to put this scene in because it makes him seem more human. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to make him seem like the criminal brain took over the whole time and he was right. just a criminal. So you had to be sympathetic to the monster. And that was the beauty of this film, that you had a sympathy, because if he had just been a marauding thing, you'd want him dead too. Mm -hmm. But you were sympathetic to him. Oh, and they took it from The Golem, which is a great sci-fi, uh, not sci-fi, silent film, The Golem. And there was a scene in The Golem just like that. And James Well, the director, took it from from the golem. He stole it from that. And that was fine. I want to talk about the laboratory, laboratory scene. Laboratory, yes. Let's the, go into the that. The camera lift shot when the Frankenstein's monster is going up in the air. Again, a, yes. a, a, a critical but important technique used as the camera's going up. It's following the monster into the air and then angles up so you can see the lightning. You can see the bolts. You can see him going up in, into the almost the sky. Mm -hmm. Great use of camera work. Just something that makes you feel like something it's going yeah. to happen. Something important is going to happen. Also, the set with the laboratory was Kenneth Strictvac. He was the electrician, and he had all these gadgets in his own place at home, in his garage and everything. They paid him $10,000 to build the lab and hire an electrician. And there's a panoply, panoply of electricity. Another word for the show, panoply. And it was a, called a vertical set, which really wasn't done because it had to be so high mm -hmm. that he went up to the heavens and the, and the lightning struck him. And the one thing great, it has what transferred into later. So I give it a 10. Mm -hmm. It transferred all the elements of great horror with lightning. The Jacob's Ladder. We never saw that before. People, Jacob's Ladder. Mm, yeah, yeah. Thunder, castles, ruins, opulent sets. The town where they had the celebration where the, the man brought his daughter yeah. and they were having the big wedding celebration for Dr. Frankenstein. It was so beautiful and detailed in the wedding festivities. All real locations sometimes and elaborate universal villages were built behind the studio. Because right. they had acres of land, California didn't have much going on then. What I noticed though yeah, what? is when the father brings his daughter through, like you mentioned, through the town and people are noticing like, okay, we're all partying, we're all having a good time. And there was, all right, we gotta get the monster, we got to get the monster. The women are cowering, like, oh my God. And they're like, let's go get him. I'm like, okay, this is very 1930s where the women have their role, we're gonna stay home and cower because well, we're going to be me. I still do that. And the men are going to get them. After these shows, I cower when no, I go you, home. No, you don't. The comedic element, there really was, and it was brilliant. There were little nuances and touches like Fritz, when he's answering the door in the castle and running up and down, he's pulling his socks up. That's a little thing a director oh, would I, do uh -huh. that is so comical okay. that he's worried about his socks when he looks like, you know, he's got rags on from Goodwill. <laughs> and Baron Frankenstein, Henry's father, Colin Clive's father, it has a great screenplay, and he completely says these off-the-wall things to his son that are really funny, especially when he visits right before the wedding. And he's commenting mm -hmm. on, like, where's your husband? Is he have another woman? Where is he? Mm -hmm. And she's saying, well, his work's important. And he's like, dang with his work, you know? It's really kind of funny. Right. And that was great. And um, also the big sets, the castle, the windmill, the laboratory has been quoted as a character of gothic delight. Mm. It's a 10, people. The Corpse Reviver number two to be paired with your movie Frankenstein. Its ingredients include three quarter ounce of gin, three quarter ounce of Contro, three quarter ounce of Le Lait Blanc or Cochi Americano, three quarter ounce of fresh lemon juice, and a dash of absinthe. Now, that's some potent stuff. If you can't find it, because in some places it's illegal, you could substitute it with a Pernod, a Herbacent, or a Sampuca. Today we're doing well, a Sampuca. Absinthe is legal in New Orleans and New York. It's not legal in New Jersey, so I couldn't find no, it, folks. It's not. So yeah, but it come I over my get house. It. I have it. And with the absinthe, really, you're just dressing the coupe glass. So this is a little bit potent for us, folks. Mmm. The Corpse Reviver is a classic I hair of the dog. I don't mind it. 
cocktail. It's good. It's good? It tastes like a, a weak limoncello, but I know it's strong mm. because it's got lots of gin because I saw you pour I it, saw it. <laughs> and he went wild. Yeah, maybe he poured a little too much gin, but we're going to find I'm gonna out. I'm going to be drunk after this. The Corpse Survivor number two is a classic hair of the dog cocktail designed to wake up the senses like Dr. Frankenstein's monster awakens to life. I'm going to have another streak in my hair after this. If you are into horror and you know classic, this is Bride of Frankenstein from the kind of sequel, which was extremely popular and even maybe more well received critically, even though Frankenstein was a critical success. But because of the costumes, I had to explain why the bride was in the Frankenstein skit in the beginning. She has to explain everything, folks. Yeah. Makes it feel good. Well, you are the Bride of Frankenstein, but explain that I am Dr. Frankenstein. Right. I've created you, I've created Frankenstein, not to be confused with Frankenstein the monster, I am Dr. Frankenstein. So I'm loving my um, medical garb. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can just like go into a hospital right now and do some surgery and get paid a lot of money for it. Yes. And Debbie, this is my heart. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. I have a heart on for you. Really? It's based on Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's famous novel written in 1818, and it actually was conceived by her and Percy Bysshe Shelley and Lord Byron run night in Byron's estate in Switzerland. Lord Byron was kind of a kook. He was an extremist, and he had these wild parties, and they did all kinds of debauchery and craziness. This had an opening, and one of the actors in it... Mm -hmm who played, I think, Dr. was it the scientist that worked with Colin Clive to mm -hmm. do the experiment and bring him to life. He came out in the theater before the show and when they showed it. And oh, he you wasn't there. Edward Van Sloan? Edward Van Sloan. Dr. Waldman. Dr. Waldman. See? And he came out and he Ooh. talked about... Uh, Pat, but it was Pat, just Pat. like a theater, like you were yeah, in a play. Yeah, it was in a theater. And that's how he did it originally, mm -hmm. when he was there, when it opened. But then, of course, they filmed that later on, and he came out and told you about it. Get ready for horror. Yes, get ready for horror. And also what you see, you know, this is like kind of like cutting the edge on what God does. Back then, actually, this was a very great franchise and started the Universal Monsters. Not, it didn't start it. It was the second film, and we're going to get to the first. But it was a most successful franchise that led up into the 50s and early 60s. Um, and Carl Lemley, who owned Universal, he was given it as a gift by his father. He loved horror, and he wanted to exploit it. And he also knew... Because his father never liked it. Never. He never, never liked, liked it. So his father, Sr., never liked this type of genre, or even to consider it. But right. Universal was going down the tubes, and we're going to talk about that in Dracula. So watch our Dracula episode. Right, yeah. Universal was in dire financial straits. Mm -hmm. It did well with Dracula, but this was like the grand slam of box office hits. For well, them. it did very well with Dracula, and they made a considerable profit on it. Mm -hmm. But Universal was in such bad shape that I think 350 employees of Universal Studios got pink slips after mm -hmm. Dracula, mm -hmm. and they couldn't understand why, because Dracula was such a success. So, But Lamley knew that he had a great formula, and he had this great idea. And of course, because Joe's the literature expert here, even though I know a lot about it too, but I make him, I make him feel good. <laughs> make feel and good. he is, because he researches the reams of paper and wick of everything. He's all over the place. All Takes over. him I am hours, all over the place. hours. But the thing is, is it comes from great literature from the past. And as I said, the outline for this was uh, done by three people, even though she pretty much gets the the credit for writing it. And in Bride of Frankenstein, the opening of Bride of Frankenstein, which you'll want to see after Frankenstein, is that night in Byron's castle where they are writing Frankenstein with a stormy and rainy and windy night. And of course, they had nothing else to do. So either wild sex, debauchery, drinking, or writing a story. That's What's what they fascinating did. about the making of this movie is that Carl Lemley Jr. Mm -hmm. was in his early 20s. Yeah. So it was actually in his, when he was about 20-ish when he thought of this idea and he was trying to take over. He was actually the head of production. Thank you, Daddy. Daddy says, you want to be head of production? Sure, why not, guy? That was his um, gift. Yeah, nice gift. But to his credit, he was also known as a go-getter. 
Um, he was also open to new genres and ideas. And this was one he felt so strongly about. And it just goes to show you, too, when you really feel strong about a certain type of art that you think is going to not only make it, but just explode a whole new type of movie genre. And the time was, as we talked about in the silent films, after World War I, the German Expressionist movement in Germany, mm -hmm. this was after the depre this was the time of the Depression. depression yep. So this was an escape from reality for the Depression. And a great thing about the times also, the first things to use air conditioning was number one, meat packing places. They had air conditioning for the meat. And the second were big, grand movie theaters. So people went in to escape the heat. They also went in to have, you know, cool air. And they also had a great afternoon's entertainment because you got so many other things as well. And it took them out of the known into horror, which isn't real. So for two hours, you completely forgot about, or an hour and a half at the time these Universal Pictures were, you completely forgot about your daily crummy life. Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff has no credit. If you watch the opening of the movie, it just has the monster because they didn't want you to know. But he was poor. It was funny because he was in his 40s when he got this role and he was an actor. Mm -hmm. But he really wasn't hitting it. Matter of fact, they talk about how he understood the common man's depression because his inability to make it in movies. Uh, while he did appear in a couple of movies prior to Frankenstein, yeah. he really They weren't wasn't, any horror. Right, yeah. right. They weren't horror. One was a gangster movie. He just wasn't making it financially. Right. And when this came uh, upon him, this was you know just something that just set him off his career into, into yeah. stardom, into, into like iconic. The interesting thing about Karloff is Lamley wanted, the producer wanted Bela Lugosi after the success of Dracula to play the monster. And it's good that he didn't, even though I love Bela Lugosi, my heart goes out to him. I just feel an affinity to him, but he is shorter. It's not the same. Now, and because well, now, you know, we're colored by that. We've seen this a thousand times, but also Lamley was in the, um, the kitchen of Universal and he was sitting there and all of a sudden Karloff was up in line to get some food. And when he looked at him, he saw his facial structure and his height and the way he carried himself. And he walked up to him and he said, listen, I want you to do a screen test and I want you to come for this picture that I'm making. Of course, of course, they knew who Lentley was. And he said, he's the perfect guy. And they did, they, they did, initially they wanted to make the makeup look like Lon Chaney because Lon Chaney was the man of a thousand faces, but they had had, Chaney had died. Right. So but they this also, was a problem. Supposedly this movie was supposed to come out earlier. Yeah. And as, as rumor had it, uh, Lon Chaney was supposed to be Frankenstein. Yeah. They were waiting for him because he was under MGM for a two picture movie deal. And they're waiting for him to come out of that. But it just, for whatever various reasons, again, this is all speculation and rumor, um, they're waiting, he passes away, and now the, now Boris Karloff. And Lugosi turned the part down because he thought, there's no dialogue to this character. I'm going to look like a dopey mute, and I just don't get it. And he's sorry that he did, because they became the icons of horror for decades but Karloff really had longevity in his career right up until you guys can remember The Grinch. I mean, you know, the cartoon from before Frankenstein. I think he made 87, 81 films. Mm -hmm. He made Frankenstein. He became the horror icon, just like Vincent Price. And he worked up until the day he died right. and did very, very well. And he was a very We're, smart businessman, yeah. too, because he took advantage of not only movies, but TV. You got to remember, mm -hmm. TV came into play uh, later on in, in in the whole film industry, and then even radio. He did radio. Right. So he took the opportunity to not only e expand his ability to get out to people, but also to make a, a good buck. And he remembered, again, going back to where he came from, he remembered how it was not having much. Correct. To now being able to do something that he right. loved. And he was a truck driver, I believe, yep. before he became, uh, a, you know, in the studios. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, we have the Universal Monsters, which were depicted on postal stamps. They had a beautiful stamp that came mm -hmm. out years ago, and they had a big thing in New York about it. Harloff also played the mummy, and that was one of the classic Universal Monsters. And that's one thing. If you can name without looking up the classic Universal Monsters, please make a comment under our show. Yep. Don't right look here. it up, but there 
there are, I think, six, actually, okay. maybe you're, even more. You're going to test Debbie. So Karloff decided to stop playing the monster after Son of Frankenstein. So you had Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, and then Son of Frankenstein. At that time, he was about 50 years old, and he basically said, it's enough, because now I'm just a prop. If you notice in this film, the monster never talks, Correct. never says a word. In The Bride, he starts to say words, which... Karloff actually disagreed with. He didn't think that was necessary. It works, though. Another one who was considered for the role, which is bizarre to me, was Leslie Howard, who was Ashley in Gone with the Wind. And they approached him about being Frankenstein, and he was like, nah, you know, he's had a big career. He's British and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, you mentioned when the first scene opens, uh, Edward Van Sloan, who's the actor, mm -hmm. he, he opens up the scene with the curtains open, explains to the audience, he was in a lot of horror Films. Correct. He was Matter in. Fact, I found it really interesting because as I was watching Dracula, and hopefully you'll see that episode, folks, I'm mm. like, wait a minute, he's Van Helsing. And I'm like, wait, I'm watching Frankenstein. Oh, wait a minute. You know, he, he's Dr. Waldman. And then he appears in other horror movies Correct. too. He was a stage actor. And all of a sudden, like, I'm watching, like, all of, many of these actors crisscross, and as you mentioned, Fritz. Yeah. It's also the same in the same situation. Right. Dwight it's Fry. In some ways good, in some ways bad, because they were so typecast. Colin Clive is Dr. Frankenstein. He was a very troubled person. He was an alcoholic. Alcoholic too, right? And he died at age 37. And he had a pretty good career. And the way that he got this job was they had seen him on the stage and were so impressed with him that they thought he would be the perfect doctor. Dwight Fry, a.k.a. Vicious Little Hunchback, he played, of course, we said, Fritz and Renfield in the two films because they're under contract. Dracula, that is. So Universal would say, okay, you're going to be in this, you're going to be in that. But let's get into James Whale, the director. James James Whale was inspired, and I hope you watch our silent film fears, because kind of we refer to it, because Frankenstein, these movies were really, um, you know, the silent era was big and created these almost. He was inspired by Cabinet of Caligari, Metropolis, and The Magician, which we talked about. He was known as the master of the horror genre. He really wrestled with his own identity because he was gay and openly out and gay I in 1920. Oh. And you were not that, although he was British, of course. He wrestled with depression. This is one thing I love, and I sound crazy, but I love craziness. And he had a Bad end, he committed suicide in his swimming pool, which was an impetus for the opening scene in Sunset Boulevard where William Holden was floating. And I hope we do that movie someday. I love that film. And he wrote the God speech in the laboratory. It's not a laboratory, it's laboratory between Colin and Dr. Waldman. And the censors objected horribly mm -hmm. to that speech. The Legion of Decency, who was like the haze before the haze came in with the, you know, censorship. The Legion of Decency said they were playing with God in the film and called it blasphemous because Frankenstein was trying to act like Colin Clive was God. And many people don't realize that now because it's such a passe kind of uh, discussion. But back then, this was, this was pushing the boundaries of God, religion, and mankind. How dare man right. have the ability to create life? And of course, it's mostly Anglophiles. It, Christianity was, you know, and the church was mm -hmm. even stronger then. And this was the political correctness back in the day. Right. And of course, you know, film really influenced people because they were addicted and people just didn't go to a movie once. Mm -hmm. They saw it again and again and again. Right. All how right. About, how about the makeup? Why was Jack Pierce? Oh, we got to so go to him. My God. Oh, Jesus, in God. Doing and the, the makeup. On Boris Karloff. Yes. Because I read that, but I didn't understand the significance. About what? About Jack I'm sorry. Pierce did Boris Karloff's makeup. Right. Yes. Well, he was the head of Universal Makeup Department, and he took forever to apply the makeup. His costume weighed 48 pounds. The boots he had on were asphalt spreaders that they used back then, and they weighed 13 pounds each, and they never let a picture of him out. Now, actually, they wanted people to be scared to see it first in film. He was green. He was green. The makeup was green. And that's why, thank God, this isn't colorized, because with beautiful black and white, it lends to the imagination that the viewer will put it in your mind as how you see it. And the makeup, so cool, was a combination of cotton, collodion, and spirit gum. 
which I used as a showgirl. Eyelids were mortician's wax. It made his forehead overhang and a little makeup around his mouth so he could see all his expressions as a person. The 1910 version of Thomas Edison, who did a short, Ugh. inspired the shape of the head. Mm -hmm. uh, Karloff also removed his bridges, his fake teeth in his mouth, oh, I didn't know that. to make his cheeks cave in. It was three and a half hours to apply the makeup, 24 hour shoots round the clock in August. Wow. They never stopped. 24 hours. In the test audience, again, they tested this out to a group of folks. Yes. People were actually fainting in the audience. They were screaming. Again, this is something that probably hadn't been seen ever for many folks. So the reaction to people, I mean, I guess they knew they had something there. The scene that we talked about earlier, it's alive. Mm -hmm. The censors edited that out. Again, trying to refrain from man ever being able to create life. Correct. Religion versus, you know, art, so mm -hmm. to speak. The trailer for Frankenstein. There were two of them. The one for the original, and then there was a reissue in 1936. Whoa! I with didn't a different know that. trailer. What was the difference between the two trailers? The significant difference between the two trailers? When it was reissued? When it was reissued. Maybe the opening wasn't in it? And in the original trailer for the 1931 classic, yes. the monster never appears. You never see the face of the monster. Oh, that sh I should have known that. Because the they reissue, wanted to see it for first yes. in the movie theater. Yes. And as you mentioned earlier, because you mentioned oh. that the credits, the monster was credited as a question mark. The marketing geniuses thought they wanted to capture the curiosity of the viewer. Correct. By never disclosing who it was right. and what they think it could be. And in the end credits, that's when they, um, they make note that it was Boris Karloff. Gothic from 1986, and it's about the Shelleys, Percy and Mary, and it's a castle, and they compete when Mary Shelley is writing Frankenstein about the plot. They will talk about how brilliant they are. It's an intellectual horror film filmed, filled with intense imagery and opium-laced nightmares, the reanimator. After odd new medical student Herbert West, played by cult favorite Jeffrey Combs, arrives on campus, a dedicated student and his girlfriend become involved in bizarre experiments centering on the reanimation of dead tissue and corpses. It's one of my favorites, not for the faint of heart. It spawned two sequels, Bride of the Reanimator and From Beyond. It's based on H.P. Lovecraft. The Black Cat yep. in 1934. Edgar Allan Poe tale, American honeymooners in Hungary become trapped in the home of a Satan worshiping priest when the bride is taken there for medical help following a road accident. Harloff and Lugosi are teamed up in a tour de force endeavor where they both shine in performances. Also, the weird German expressionist set of design is a must see. You gotta see these things. I'm forcing you, it's your homework. Gods and Monsters, 1980. A cerebral look at director James Whale, who directed Frankenstein, and his recollection of his experiences with Frankenstein. Played by Ian McKellen, who is gay, so he had a little insight into the character, with his co-star Brendan Fraser, who at the time was the flavor of the month. At the end of his career, facing his debilitating ramifications of a stroke and ongoing dementia, he's all alone, it brings up the monster within himself grappling with his own sexual identity and uselessness at the end of his career. The Mummy, 1932. A resurrected Egyptian mummy searches Cairo for the girl he believes is the reincarnation of his long lost princess that he loved. Harloff plays two parts. I'm Hotep, the mummy conjurer, and the mummy itself. It's one of the greatest scenes in horror. If you even watch 10 minutes of this, you gotta watch the first when the mummy comes alive in the tomb and the archaeologist sees it. And actually, the mummy, in the original mummy, is only in it for a couple of minutes, but people never remember it that way. When the mummy returns, he's in it more. And that is my watch list, and you have to see every single one. Joe, if you haven't seen it, you gotta see them. If you never s had a good idea of what horror movies are and where they came from, this is where you need to start. You need to start with Dracula, you need to start with 
um, Frankenstein, we mentioned Dr. Calgary, we mentioned that earlier. That sets the stage for an evolution of a horror genre. Frankenstein is a cultural icon. Pop culture, no matter what generation, no matter what period of time, between Frankenstein costumes for little kids, between Frankenstein references in animation, in comic books, everywhere, I mean, there's that iconic look, the bolts in the neck, the green squared face. Turn off for me here, why I gave it a nine and not a 10? Two significant reasons. Um, I thought the ending was kind of sucky. But then they end with with Dr. Frankenstein in bed with his wife and Elizabeth, the Elizabeth, yeah. And hit and the maids and, and the people were like listening to try to find out. I thought that was a dumb Well, we had to know as an audience ending. in 1931 that he was safe. And yeah. plus it was a sequel. Yeah, well they opened it up and then that's my second reason why you had Bride of Frankenstein. I don't know how you could give Frankenstein a 10 and Bride a, presumably a 10, because I would give Bride a 10 versus Frankenstein, give it a nine. And actually, critics gave Bride a higher score, They and that's great. And hopefully we'll do sequels someday, and mm -hmm. one, or horrible sequels, and then a show for great the greatest sequels. But And you hit every nail on the head, and why I think people should watch it, it set this standard for the horror genre with iconic visuals and scene, theme, science, creation, humanity. They influence the popular culture, a timeless classic, another great literary novel brought to the screen. And still to this day, the monster is recognizable to all and still always present every Halloween. So we want everybody to have a happy Halloween. Yes. And while I revive myself with this Corpse Reviver number two, yeah. and boy, it is definitely reviving me, I folks. love this drink. I yeah, like it. After this drink. Look at I drank the whole thing. I'm going to eat the lemon peel. Eat the lemon piece, please. I want to see that. Mm. So, Debbie, after we finish our Corpse Reviver number two, where are we going next? Joe, how many times do I have to tell you? You never know where we're going until we go there. Mm.